helps if you hit record the first time. <laughs> I thought you forgot my name. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. This is uh, welcome to episode 12 of The Approach. Uh, this is the series from St. Christopher's where we uh, talk about uh, the upcoming lessons for the week. I'm Father Chris Steele. I'm the pastor of St. Christopher's. And with us today, we have Father Michael Mills, who is the rector of Good Shepherd Episcopal Church. And uh, that's significant for us today because this Sunday is what we call Good Shepherd Sunday. And so this is, uh, this is a special feast for uh, Good Shepherd, where I worked for a, couple, a few years. And it's going to be a great celebration for them. And so welcome, Father Mills. Thank you, Father Steele. I'm very glad to be here. Um, great. This is a, a new experience for me. Usually, Good Shepherd has the Bishop on Good Shepherd Sunday. It's our traditional confirmation day. Um, and uh, but our confirmation this year is in May. I believe that this is my ninth Sunday, uh, uh, ninth uh, Good Shepherd Sunday at Good Shepherd, and the first time I'm preaching on our Feast of Title. So I get to read the lessons afresh and with new eyes this week with everybody else. Well, that's great. And so if you're joining us for the first time, uh, so this is really a first look at these scriptures. So this is an opportunity for us, the clergy, to talk to you and anybody who's interested in this about uh, possible approaches that we can take a look at. And so uh, with that in mind, so the, Father Mills, one of the first things that, that we do since we're coming out of Corona time, I always ask kind of what's going on around uh, our community. How have you guys been uh, changing things and doing things? How have you uh, muscled your way through Corona and what's it look like coming out? We had a couple of um, very distinct phases of our life together. Our ability to meet in the building in person has really changed uh, our, um, our way of being. Uh, for most of the year, our 1030 service was entirely pre-recorded and the clergy's pastoral task was to connect with people online through Facebook chat or through messages uh, during the service. But we are, uh, we're starting out um, uh, moving toward uh, open attendance in the fall. Uh, so we're doing less and less special things online and really focusing more on live streaming what we're doing in person. As you know, that's not in, that having a live stream service, it doesn't mean you just flip on the camera and uh, let it run, but there's always some attention beforehand uh, to the online community. So we're, we're finding our new way there. Um, I, I feel like we're doing well. One of the things that I've decided, Father, is that um, I'm going to worry about uh, attendance and money and that sort of thing probably in September or October of this year. Uh, the only thing that I learned from uh, watching the patterns uh, of attendance and giving during Corona season is that I have no ability to predict attendance or money during Corona season. And I've read all the pundits that they're not any better at it than I am. So uh, it's a moment of of grace and reliance on providence and God's redemptive power. And uh, so I think we're doing great. Ask me in September and I'll have a better answer for you. That is good. Do you, you anticipate you're going to, that, that the streaming is, is ever going to go away? I think we're kind of resigned here to that's going to be the new, I, I hate the phrase, the new normal, but I think, I, I think we're not sure. going to see it go normal away. For now, I think it's, yeah, I think that's right. I think we have some people, uh, our, we have two services. We have an eight o'clock said service and a 1030 with music. And those like just about everywhere else have a different, a slightly different demographic, though we have young people who go to the eight o'clock and uh, some of our older parishioners who prefer the 1030. But uh, trying to decide whether we're going to live stream twice on a Sunday and trying to decide if we're going to archive. One of the uh, things that we've learned is that uh, people like the convenience of online worship and they, their Sunday morning can be Sunday afternoon or Monday when they're walking or something like that. And uh, trying to decide if that's a, if that's a feature or a bug, uh, does, does worshiping on Monday fit what we're trying to do with helping people become better disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, it, so those it's are the, tough, it's tough for us at it's a sacramental church that way. It's tough for us at a sacramental church to say, we're going to do it online so much relies on touch and things like that. Well, with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead. Let's uh, let's take a look. So usually our, our our habit has been to to start with the Old Testament reading. And of course, we're in Acts now, uh, which isn't really Old Testament, but we 
pretend it is. Um, our habit has been to do that, but since it is Good Shepherd Sunday, I thought it would be helpful for us maybe to start with the gospel reading uh, for this coming Sunday. And um, and so why don't we take a look at that? I'm going to, so for reference, uh, we have uh, Acts 4. Uh, we're continuing in 1 John, the uh, the epistle of John. And this week is John's gospel. The Good Shepherd narrative starts, it is mostly in chapter 10. Um, and of course, this is the Sunday that we read the 23rd Psalm uh, because it is the, the shepherd Psalm. So with that in mind, so from John uh, chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my father. And so there ends the reading from the gospel of John. Now, father, I, I, I do preach this one fairly often, depending on where I've been. Uh, when I've been at Good Shepherd, of course, I, the bishop would preach this. But when I've been at other people, uh, other places, St. Luke, St. Mary's, other places, I have always preached this. I find it, um, I find it hard, I, not hard. I find the trap that I fall into is I try to find, I, I usually end up thinking of some kind of trivia about sheep and shepherds that I can kind of hang my hat on and Right. tell a story and and do that i i find that that is getting old and i find myself not wanting to do that this week um how, how, how do we how would how do you take a stab at this initially what do you think you know i think it's really hard uh to come up with um not just something new to say about a familiar text but some way of uh seeing a text in a new way uh, our friend Will Willimon has a, a great book on how to preach at Christmas and Easter, um, and it's called something like Easter Again. It's the, about that burden of preaching. Um, you know how this is on Christmas, right? There's, there's not really a, uh, there's, nobody's shocked when the angels show up to the shepherds. Uh, right. You start the gospel and nobody thinks, ooh, a shepherd story. I wonder what's going to happen. They know it's coming. Uh, this is the same one. We, uh, I believe when you were here, we had some of the Confirmation kids memorize one verse so they could all say this gospel together. Uh, so that, yeah, that's the same challenge that I have. Here's what I'm thinking uh, about for, um, uh, for this Sunday. Uh, one is, um, you know, John's gospel was arranged in terms of a sign and a teaching. Mm -hmm. There are, Jesus will do a miracle and then he'll preach on uh, something related, but uh, it's not always clear to me what the relationship is. That's, uh, uh, I think John writes it that way, and I think Jesus teased our minds into active thought that way. The sign that precedes John 10, the two passages about being the good shepherd, is the story of the man born blind. Uh, and so there's a story and a conflict and then this teaching, and I'm really trying to think through uh, how those relate to one another. I don't have an answer there, but the story that goes before this is that there's a man who has been born blind and the disciples ask Jesus, um, who sinned, right? Were his parents sinful or was he sinful uh, so that he deserved 
blindness. And Jesus says, neither of them, this is for God's glory. And Jesus heals him, he heals the man. And then there's, um, there's this really funny uh, story where some, uh, some of the authorities, uh, John names uh, Pharisees among the authorities, he names some high priests, and he names this general term of Jews or Judeans or somehow people who live in that area. Um, they go to his the man's parents and say, and say, who healed your son? And the parents say, uh, you know, he's, he's an adult. He can answer for himself. Uh, and so they go ask the man, and the man uh, eventually encounters Jesus and proclaims Jesus. And then there's a reaction, uh, especially by the Pharisees, uh, to Jesus healing this man. And in response, Jesus says to them, I am the good shepherd. So I think what I'm, what I'm pondering right now is how is that a response to the question of the Pharisees? What is the specific reason Jesus tells this story? Um, maybe if I can figure that out, I can find a new thing to say uh, about shepherding. Yeah, I think uh, you know one of the things that strikes me, I did notice that it comes right after that story. So a, a couple of things for context there. The, the reason that the Pharisees are so upset about this ostensibly is because uh, he healed on the Sabbath. Right. Now, I imagine there were other people doing other things on the Sabbath they didn't get quite so worked up about, but this is Jesus after all. Uh, yeah. And the other thing I, that I think is important for context is that when it comes to Jesus's trial at the high priest house, this is kind of, this, this, this incident is kind of the nail in the coffin, right? The, the, the man born blind gets, comes back and is a witness at Jesus's trial at Caiaphas's house. So with that, it, it's, it's not, it, it's, it's not just a, it's not one of these random miracles like any of them are, but it's not like, you know, you're going through and see a miracle here, a miracle there, and they add up to something. This is, this is one of those miracles that's pretty significant. Holly, you've got something for us. Oh, yes. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's strange how different things pop out at me in these conversations or seeing it on a screen and hearing, I, I forget, our, our guest, Father from Good Shepherd, <laughs> your name. Yes. Anyway, Mills. Mills, okay. Um, so what popped out in the reading and then and, and what your comments about uh, the hired hand sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and runs away. Um, and what you're talking about, uh, the 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 blind man. Well, was that the parents' fault or the man's fault? And this theme of the parents and the uh, it it reminds me of something my husband used to say. No offense to working mothers whatsoever, but I remember he said, nobody cares as much as the parent. He said, you know, you, the, the nanny or the teacher or the babysitter, they're never gonna care quite as much as the parent. And for some reason, what jumps out at me reading this about the hired hand is that nobody is going to care as much as Jesus, hmm. the, the ultimate parent. And we don't, even you know for ourselves we might not care about ourselves as much as jesus does sometimes we beat ourselves up we we don't nourish ourselves the way we should and we don't always know our we don't know ourselves as well as jesus does we we've, we've got some delusions or whatever so that is something that jumped out at me reading this uh and and hearing some of your comments about uh, the parent, the, the hired hand, and Jesus. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's a that's really good. I think the, this it, part of that is a that resonates with me on a life stage uh, teaching that we reach a point at which we have to learn to parent ourselves to to treat yeah. ourselves as though we are a person that we have to care for. Yeah, um, well, that's true. Yeah. yeah, right. Well, it's just that they've come of age, and and it just made me think that John and Claire are both very you know very recently of age uh so john and claire uh michael's uh, son George, and, okay my, son and son my children and daughter. are 22 and 24 yeah. so yeah yeah 
And so wow. that's so when when they when they say it's almost like the the parents of in this context, the parents had washed their hands of uh, of their son, um, mm-hmm. which I yeah, not having children or particularly children of that age, it, it strikes me as odd, probably not as odd as it strikes those of you who have children that age. I would think. Yeah, it might be that that's that's probably true. Uh, one of which is within earshot, doing some you know online online lecture. A university is happening here in our house online. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the, uh, Father Steele. I think there's a there's a spectrum there, right? I think there's a uh, there's a point at which, um, you know, the I as their father, and I'm sure their mother as well, but I'm going to speak for myself, are, are always going to incline to stand between the wolf and the sheep, right? I always want to intervene to protect them from danger. So there's that level that I, so far has not gone away. I don't think it ever will. Um, there's something about the way the shepherd provides for the sheep uh, that does change. Um, the um, So, I mean, if I'm inclined sometimes to quote John 9 there, right? When they say, um, right, who's going to do laundry or uh, what are we having for dinner tonight? What are we having for dinner tonight? It was like, I'm likely to say, you're of age, right? You can speak for yourself, right? You, you can handle that on your own. Um, so well, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. But the, sure. the response of the parents are, are funny. Let me, can I say one other thing about sure. Good Shepherd before we go on? Yeah. So one of the difficulties of, uh, preaching this gospel is that uh, we call what you and I, Father, do pastoral ministry. And this image of Jesus as the good shepherd is woven through a lot of um, a lot of our spiritual literature. Um, thinking of uh, right Gregory the Great, pastoral care, or, right? That, that, that right. Well, and Gregor means pa- Gregor is another word for pastor, right? Right. Yeah, so that's kind of a, uh, a theme here. If we look back, um, um, you know, Psalm 80, hero, shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. Um, um, I myself will shepherd my sheep. You know, woe to, the, woe to you who call yourself shepherds. Um, the shepherd was a kingly title and not a, uh, a caring for title in that way. And so I think there might be something about... Um, the way we see the gentle hand of Jesus here caring for the sheep, uh, and yet that is that is another claim. Calling himself the good shepherd uh, is a way of claiming to be right, the heir of David and the true Messiah, uh, that he is the one who rules over the sheep um, and not just, you know, feeds them and cuddles them. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and I had never put that together before that that really he's he's making a comparison of himself probably with david here yes um and it reminds it reminds me of jeremiah um with that famous passage i will give you shepherds that we we talk about when we're when we're talking about uh seeking vocations right for for the ministry uh that's that's one of the that's one of our go-to uh passages that we pray and study when we're talking about raising up vocations for new pastors. Um, I think, you know, I think one of the things too is, you know, not, not all shepherds are good. Right. Mm. And there's a, there's a distinction here. He, this one is the good shepherd, right? We've just seen uh, coming off of a story about some not so great shepherds, right? Parents who, it's one thing for him to be of age, but again, this man was born blind. That's a pretty quick turnaround to, I have a son that was born blind and is helpless, but now he's of age and he doesn't, you know, that, 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 that's a really quick pivot. Don't you think? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And also you have the shepherds of, of Israel. Um, these, the, the, the Pharisees, the priests, the, the temple crowd, and so th- they have something of a pastoral ministry too. And I think they, w- they would see that for themselves. Um, although I'm not sure about that. I, w- I wonder if they at this time would have seen their religious role as something of a pastor. Like I, like I say, you and I talk about 
being pastors, and that we see that as a primarily religious task. Yes. I don't know if that's been a shift that's happened since we thought about priests and kings in a biblical and Old Testament sense. You know, we'll see in the Acts reading that there's a, a, a remnant there of a, a, a tension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, and so for by the time of Jesus, for the last hundred years or so, a little over hundred years, the um, or growing over the last hundred years, the Sadducees become more and more associated with the temple and the religious authorities. And the Pharisees are the ones who are out in the villages. So if the Pharisees see themselves as pastors, I would say they see themselves in that shepherding role and in, in the way we use it mo in the modern world, not as not as kings and priests, but as ministering directly to people. Um, so maybe that, I don't know, I'd, I'd be interested to know if, the, if Pharisees and Sadducees would both see themselves as pastors, but in different ways. Yeah, well, and it's funny, you know, G Jesus really does succeed at bringing the Pharisees and the Sadducees together here. He does. <laughs> So, you know, with that in mind, why don't, why don't we take a look at this, uh, at this Acts lesson? So, uh, Father, would you read that for us? Sure. This is from uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. The rulers and elders and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priest's family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who is sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, and has become the cornerstone. There's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. That is, um, you know, just, it struck me just now as you read it, that's not really a direct quote from Psalm 118, is it? I don't think so. I, I, I need to... I think there's an av I think I think the U is an addition by Peter. Let me take a look at that now that I think about it. I'm gonna look it up in the in the prayer book here. You know, one of the let's see. Let's see. Is it eight? Is it one eighteen or is it eighteen? I'll get it's, the I think it's So, yeah, I'm gonna take a look here. So, and it's not easy to find in this what I have here. Well, in any case, yeah. So, um, and so we well, and while while we're figuring that out, just a little context here. Also, this is after Pentecost. This is as uh, Peter and John have been healing the the man, the lame man on man on the way, and he reached out his palm and asked for for an alm. Uh, we have that song. I was going to say if you knew that psalm, yeah, silver and yeah. gold have I none, but what I have I give to thee. Yes. Uh, so it, it is in the in the name of Jesus Christ, and so they are. This is this is a, it's almost a replay of John nine rather than yeah. picking up and then relating directly to John ten. Sure, and there's a similar structure in in John as well because they have this encounter that and a healing miracle, and the healing miracle is what draws the crowd, uh, and then they preach the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, so right. they are, all of chapter three is this healing miracle. Um, and then the sermon that Peter gives after the healing miracle, and then at chapter four, verse one, um, the uh, it's a long list, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, the the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees. 
So one of the here's a, here's a back to the Sadducees and Pharisees thing. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things that I think is notable by the time we get to Acts um, is that um, the Sadducees are specifically uh, offended by the preaching of a particular doctrine. Um, the uh, the Sadducees, there's a, this whole thing about their relationship to the temple and where they find power. Um, but the Sadducees believed in a, in a small canon. They would have said only the first five books of the Old Testament were inspired or authoritative. Uh, they only read the Torah authoritatively. And there's nothing in the Torah that speaks of the resurrection of the body. And so, but the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the body. So even Jesus has that story from the the. Uh, from the Sadducees about the man who had seven wives, or the woman, had, I'm sorry, other way around, the woman who had seven husbands, and uh, who's going to be married to her in the resurrection. Well, they hear this, they see this man uh, healed, um, and they hear this preaching of, about Jesus, and the thing that really offends them is that the apostles are preaching the resurrection of the body, um, and so they arrest them. So it's, just, uh, it's as much about agreeing with the Pharisees about the resurrection as it is preaching Jesus um, that get them in trouble. So, yeah, it's Peter and the, the, the prisoners there in verse six, when they made the prisoners stand in their midst, that's Peter and John. Um, yeah. Who still get along at this time, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, and that's, and, that, and that it brings up, it's interesting you say something about, you know, a, a doctrine that offends, and I think in here, in both of the, in in this lesson in particular, but I'm, I'm going to try to connect it back with our gospel, there is this notion of, I don't want to call it exclusivity, but there's certainly this idea of the exceptionalism of Jesus yeah. and what, what Jesus's ministry and his uh, passion, death, and resurrection has done for the world. There's some we, we want to back off a lot of times as Christians, saying that we are the only way. Uh, that uh, that Christianity is the the only way that anybody that can be saved. That by the name of Jesus is the only way that can be saved. It's all through the New Testament, and we want to back off of that a lot because Jesus does in fact love everybody. He is he has come for the salvation of the world. So. Uh, so there, there, there's a tension there that, that, that might be worth us thinking about what is it about this doctrine that offends us, you know, as the hearers today. Yeah, I think there's something in, in uh, the exclusive claim of Jesus uh, that's a little tempered by his saying in John 10, uh, I have sheep that uh, you don't know of, right? That there will be one flock, one shepherd. Uh, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold, is what he says. And we have yes. St. Paul's meditation on uh, the mystery of what God is doing with the Jews who do not accept Jesus as the Messiah and how that opens an opportunity to bring in Gentiles. Um, I don't know, a little, bit of, a little bit of Karl Rahner and a little bit of that scene at the end of one of C.S. Lewis's novels where the soldier of Tash gets saved. All that kind of goes together in my head to say that um, this is the way of life that I know works. This is the way that we may be saved. Um, and I don't really know what God is doing with other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is the thing that I do know uh, works. I try, so there's a, um, a, a little bit of humility in saying that God can do what God wants to do. It's his house. So he can let in whoever he wants. I know that my call is to preach the gospel. And I know that people who, uh, who believe in the, the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus and set themselves or allow themselves to be set on the pilgrim's way with us are headed toward the kingdom. So, yeah, um, there you go. And it kind of, it, it kind of, it kind of goes back to, you know, what is, what, what is the, a shepherd able to do? And so he's going to bring, he's going to bring them in also, yes. right? So there'll be one flock and one shepherd. So obviously there is some there is some part of this work that Jesus is doing that uh, you know we have we he's he's giving us a, a, a metaphor here he's giving us uh, some indication of how 
his saving work is done, which he doesn't often do, right? Um, he, uh, he, he's, he's more concerned about, um, how, should, how should we put it? He, he's, he's, concern, he's concerned about faith. He's concerned about repentance. He's concerned about what we do. This is, it's kind of a rare insight into what Jesus does. Yes. And, um, and that gets us into not only the, not only the, that external, that, that going outside of the flock that we know, but it also gets us into the, this idea of laying down our life, right? Or Jesus laying down his life. Yeah, so you have to start there, don't you? I lay down my life for the sheep. Uh, if we're if we're looking for um, uh, this exclusive claim, uh, this particular claim of Jesus, yeah, we we have to start with saying that whatever it is that divides people from one another, whatever it is that reunites people with God, whatever it is that breaks the power of uh, Satan, sin, and death, right? How many different ways can I say the word atonement without saying the word atonement? There are lots of, <laughs> right? Whatever it is that fixes the problem is the death and resurrection of Jesus. That is the one thing that fixes the problem. There aren't many ways of saying Jesus died for those people, but those people have a different path, right? Jesus laying down his life for the sheep uh, is a particular specific exclusive claim. Um, and then, right? Then we can think yeah. about how, how big the sheepfold is once we accept that Jesus is the one who, uh, uh, who atones and reconciles and reunites. Yeah. Holly, is your hand up? A, yes. a new... yes, it, is, it is back up. Sorry. All right. <laughs> That's fine. So leave that line highlighted because that, that'll help me. I, I have a question and I uh, apologize if I just didn't understand what you just tried to explain. That <clears throat> to me, it's very interesting to think about that. Uh, he says, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. There will be one flock, one shepherd. So what does that mean? I, I just really don't know. Um, that you will only achieve eternal life um, in heaven by faith alone. What does that mean for non-Christians? How does that connect with, I will bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, one flock, one shepherd. Um, mm -hmm. How's that, uh, what does that mean for the the Muslim people or whatever? Yeah. I don't know. Well, I think we have, I think we have one, we have like, I think, and correct me if I, I'm misinterpreting you, Father Mills. Um, Jesus is going to die, is suffer, die, and rise again. And that work is going to accomplish what he says it will. It is for the salvation of the world. Now, how we participate in that, I think these passages are an open question there. Um, yeah. There's a, you know, th there's a proclamation of the gospel, and there's something to be said about proclaiming the gospel in a way that it can be received and that's that falls on well father you and me it falls a lot on it falls on all christians but you know if we put this collar on it it's it's a spe it's a particular burden um but how that how that plays out is is not something that there you go. No, gives us an insight to um it may be yeah so uh hi eugene um, well, I'm just now being able to get on. I'm sorry. I'm glad. That's all right. Hey, Bill, how you doing? Oh, I'm uh, I'm I'm confused. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead with your discussion, please. So, so the question is, what does this have to do with other with other faiths? Uh, so, I do want to say a couple of things there. One is that I don't know that other faiths is what Jesus has in mind here. It doesn't mean that uh, we can't think by analogy with other people of other faiths. Um, but I think um, Jesus is here contrasting what he says earlier in his ministry about salvation coming from the Jews. Jesus has a specific mission to the, uh, to the people of Israel. 
and yet uh, we, he sees uh, Gentiles coming in uh, see, and, and seeking faith. And so uh, the other foal can mean Gentiles. That's, uh, that's true. And by the time John writes, you have a very mixed uh, church ethnically. Um, so other sheep that do not belong to this fold, it's probably people like you and me. Um, what does it say by, uh, by analogy for people of other faiths? Well, again, I, I, don't, I don't have a complete theology of um, the relationship between religions, but I do say this, that uh, whatever we say as Christians about uh, salvation, for people who, do, who are not explicitly Christian um, is that it only works because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that somehow that is an act of God beyond the bounds of the church. I don't think we're, a, we're able to say based on what Jesus says in the biblical record that um, somehow their religion works for them and our religion works for us, right? Um, if in fact, um, you know, the uh, people outside of our faith, people of no faith, people who have lost their faith, um, people that we would be concerned about. I think we can be begin by saying that as much as uh, we love them and are worried about them, God loves them more and has more compassion for them than we do, and that we can be happy because that is a problem that is a problem for God and not for us uh, to solve other than bearing witness to our faith. So I don't think that based on John or anything that St. Paul says, we can say, yes, Islam definitely works. Um, uh, uh, but I think we can have compassion and assume that God is as compassionate as we are. I don't know that there is an answer. Uh, yeah. uh, that's very helpful advice, though, actually, because it's sort of a, a quandary. And yeah. what's the what's the appropriate thing to do there? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't get us off the hook for proclaiming our faith though. Right. It's that um, is absolutely right. Yeah. And so, so that, and, and that is, um, there is this, uh, this tell us this end that God has in mind of everyone being one of, of, of their, you know, their sheep, not of the fold, but we're going to make this one one flock under a single shepherd right yes. and that you know that picks up a theme that he's these that uh that well it introduces a theme that jesus is going to pick up in you know the last discourse what john, what john has instead of a last supper it is a, a long long uh passage on you know you should be one as as we are one um that's you know as jesus's prayer and so you know we, I, I think we tend to focus, that whether it's in the church or in our identity as a nation or however we're going to identify ourselves, there's always something that we will look for that says we are in this group and this is the boundary and everybody on the other side of that boundary is outside of our group. That, that's, a, that's a temptation I think that we all have. And I almost want to say Jesus is starting to try to confront that and just decides he's done enough miracles for one day. Uh, <laughs> I, there's, there is that, that dynamic. I read about it in Mich Michel Foucault, but I learned it really from seventh graders. And that is at some points in our lives, we define who we are by the fact that we have friends who are not, right? We can define who we are not, right? So I know that I'm a certain sort of student, certain sort of person, a certain sort of friend, because I can, we can all point to those people over there and say, we're not like that. Um, and I think that's the sense of there being one flock and one, uh, and one shepherd that, and again, as Father Steele said, of uh, the, the, the flock being one as Jesus and the Father are one is that, uh, yeah, as Christians, we, we define ourselves by the relationships we have and not by who we can exclude. Right. Right. It's helpful. Ahead, okay. I, that's very helpful. Thank you. Good. Good. <clears throat> yeah. And so, so yeah, the, the, the context of this is important, right? 
And so what, how do you often, when we, when we have a passage, it comes up every year and you have always got to leave a little meat on the bone, right? Right. Um, so that you can come back to it when it, well, this one comes back every year, but, um, but, and it comes up often in funerals as I guess you're finding out and, or re-realizing you knew it already, but, um, but I, there's there there's a way we use the context of all of this and, and split a hair and sometimes it's based on what's going on in our parish sometimes it's based on you know a news cycle how, how how do you how do you make that pivot how do you yeah make a judgment on that sometimes boy that's a that's a um that is a tough one um yeah. i think part of the Part of the homiletical task, part of the task of the preacher is to, uh, is to think with the people and in some sense to think in front of the people in a biblical way. Um, so the first thing I'd say is that we want to um, think about it in order, right? So if, um, you know, I, I read the paper as well and listen to NPR on the way in, so everybody's thinking right now about uh, the death of George Floyd and the trial of Derek Chauvin. Um, and I don't know that John 10 or Acts 4 has anything to say about that. Uh, but I do know that um, the, um, the task is uh, to read first the scriptures and see what the scriptures have to say and somehow see what they might say by analogy to our modern day and not to read the newspaper and go looking in the scriptures for uh for what they might say that's that's not a very satisfactory thing when somebody says this is bothering me what does the bible have to say about this um but i think the task is is not to apply the bible to the news but to learn to think like the bible does to learn to think like scripture um um so sometimes it, it, there's not a matchup. You can't get around to whatever it is that's on, on people's hearts and minds. And that's that we have to let the prayers of the faithful and the intercessory nature of the mass and those sorts of things carry that weight for us. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's, and, and that, and, and that's a particular way that our tradition deals with scripture because it's, it's equally valid, right. To, to say, you know, we we can use church time to find the scriptures, to look at it and see what's going on. Other traditions do that. We would do that in a Sunday school setting yes. or uh, or as a one off. You know, I, I, I recall one of the times you came to uh, St. Christopher's, you and you and uh, Father Matt were reading but... a speech by Martin Luther King. And 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 all of that had was bearing on uh MLK Day and and you as priests were you know as we had the discussion scripture bore a lot on that but that's yes, something we that's, right. that's something we we do outside of this and I think it's something too that we think think about when we're preaching uh, we, we we have two real tasks here um, one is to proclaim the gospel right it's the the that there's the the saving life death and resurrection of Jesus. And this is apparent here in this way. There's another task we have of, of teaching the scriptures, right? For, for some of our people, this is the, the, all the scripture they get yes. uh, during the week. And if we, have, if we have a visitor, it might be the first time that they have heard the scripture at all. So we have, you know, we, we have a context issue. We have, there's, a, there, there, there's a teaching element. There's a and there's a proclamation element, and it all comes under that umbrella of preaching that sometimes can can make it difficult, especially when we're not on a track and we have one of these one-off Sundays that yeah. uh, you know we've been following you know a, a cycle of of reads. This there have been resurrection narratives up to this point, and all of a sudden, boom! Here's here's Good Shepherd Sunday, divorced from the sign that uh that initiates it sure right right though that, frankly i would uh, if if the lectionary said read from john chapter 9 verse 1 through john 10 verse 18 um 
you know, if you get, if it, it said, read the sign and the preaching at the same time, boy, I sure would be tempted to cut that down myself. The, it's, a, <laughs> it's a long gospel reading. It doesn't bother us with the woman at the well in Lent. Right. That's a long reading too. You're right. Right. Uh, that, um, can I throw in one other thought here? That was also helpful to think of, go from the Bible to your, you know, problem of the day, because otherwise, Father Chris, I remember you once talked about cherry picking and cherry picking these, you know, little snippets from the Bible. And it is, it, it's probably a, a bad temptation to just Google search verses that, you know, deal with racism or verses that deal with this or that or the other problem. And then you're going to get some cherry picked little views that probably fit what you're looking for in the first place because you're going to scan oh that's that's what i and then you're at the center instead of the the word of god being at the center so i guess that's a, a good point about stick to the lectionary or the the prayer plan you have or the bible reading plan anyway <laughs> bill you've got a you've got something for us yeah well i've got problems with my zoom and being able to do it because i don't see what i think i i don't see myself and I, but anyhow beside that's beside the point uh what holly's saying uh, strikes me interesting uh, well all of the conversation that i've been fortunate enough to hear um is like there's a you addressing the fact that that's a, a two-pronged attempt to rationally consider yourself uh, sharing the gospel. One is the natural, I mean, the, the natural way, which we were, we were born into Adam, is to whatever we do shows us that. I mean, whatever I do, that's a demonstration, we might say, because we learn to, when daddy said, don't do this, we, and we get spanked maybe once, or we get convinced that that's right, we don't do it, but the, the difference, the, set, the first step was you go to daddy and ask. And I think the Psalms or the, something else I read on the, the preparation for this had to do with saying you first, and, and I heard your guest say it too, you first have to go to God. And if you haven't been fed, properly with the nourishment of the truth eternal truth you won't be able to you'll have to depend on temporary truths and so that's the i mean it's mm. if i don't know if i got the message of what y'all were talking about or not but but but, but the two things one comes really before the other i don't i wasn't no. born again when i was born from my mother i was born again when that experience that you've been describing happened to me, where yeah. I received something that was eternally true. And, 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 th and then I, did, I didn't even start reading the Bible. I'm, after that, for about, I, I, I got kicked out of college and I went to work for Delta and I worked for Delta for about three or four years. So that was a, from when I was born again till then, I didn't even read the Bible. And then I ran across mm -hmm. something that let me read the Bible. And all of a sudden, these things started happening that, yeah. that enlightened my soul or enlightened my spiritual attitude or something. So, right. but both are involved. But anyhow, that's all I wanted to say sure. is I agree with everything I've heard this morning. Yeah. I try to always understand it or describe it. And that may be a yeah. handicap. Right. Well, you know, and this is something that Father Father Mullins was talking about last week with us. He talked about how in his preparation he does he has a process uh, of lectio, right? And yeah, lectio and 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 just kind of swimming in those in the scriptures or or floating in them a little bit. Yeah, the, uh, the Father Matt uh, Burdett introduced me to lectio, and I'd never seen it before, and, and I got the book and i've got that and yes that that does yeah help me yes all right father mills i think i cut you off just a second ago oh no I was, I, what i was going to say is that i wanted to underline that 
one of the things we know about the spiritual life is that uh, not only does a person never get beyond the scriptures uh, in praying, but that increased contact with the Bible uh, does great uh, things for, especially the new Christian or the person starting again, uh, that going back and just having a habit of daily Bible reading, whether that's using uh, you know, planned by somebody else or the daily office or reading this uh, lessons for the upcoming Sunday, all of those things have a tremendous effect on how fast we grow uh, in, in the knowledge and love of God. Um, and I think there's something really important about uh, thinking about prayer and temptation and, and discernment. Uh, and that is the, we've all heard a rumor that somebody says something, said something and have had the experience of thinking, you know, that really doesn't sound very much like her, or that doesn't sound like something he would say. Um, and so uh, by reading the scriptures, by reading the word of God, we kind of understand better and better what the voice of the shepherd sounds like. Jesus says that we will recognize his voice. And so um, sometimes that means learning what his voice sounds like by reading the Bible so that when he calls us to something, when we feel moved in prayer, it's a familiar voice. Or we know, on the other hand, that it doesn't sound like something Jesus would say. And we know that however strongly we feel like that is probably not from him. Well, Father Mills, th thank you. For this. I, I'm, I'm mindful of your time, and I know you've got, uh, again, you've got you've got a lot coming up. I believe and, my next uh, appointment is ringing the doorbell right now. All right. Well, um, will, will you close us with a prayer, and then I'll wrap up from here, and then please give uh, Jimmy and Aaron a hug for me. I sure will. Do you mind if I use the prayer for this coming Sunday? Please. Let us pray. Oh, God, whose son Jesus is the good shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads. With you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father Mills. I am very glad to be with you. I'll see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank so you. So this has been Thank you. So this has been episode 12 of The Approach. And so if you're joining us online, I encourage you to uh, consider, uh, I hope this ministry has been a blessing for you. If it has, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the little bell icon that will alert you when we have new content. And also, if this ministry has been a blessing to you, I'd encourage you to consider supporting St. Christopher's using the link that is in the description to this video. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Look at us.